Good. All right. All right. I will go, go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Scott Rolliter. I'm the instructor up here at Boyard Factory. I see a few new faces. Um, I do these clinics once a month, usually on the second Saturday of every month at this time. <laughs> and uh, we bought some camera equipment about, um, I don't know, four or five months ago. So now we're streaming it live on Facebook. And for anybody who's watching online, um, these are also being recorded. Uh, and it will be on the YouTube channel on my web page as well, which is mypoolblog.com. And so um, this is actually number five of an eight-part series. Um, started out talking about fundamentals and then working on um, shot making, position play, English, and this is going to be on safeties and defense. So I'm kind of trying to cover kind of A to Z on how to play pool kind of from beginning to end. Um, so like I said, today we're going to talk about safeties, which are pretty important. A lot of people kind of gloss over that. Uh, they focus on their offense and shot making and things like that. But the uh, the defensive part of the game is is super important um, at really at all levels. Um, even the pros, a lot of people have a misconception. Uh, a lot of the matches we watch, if you watch pool matches on YouTube, matches are kind of the people that are doing well in the tournament. They're late stages of the tournament. And so you see a lot of people putting two and three racks together in a row and, and running out all the time. But the average for a typical tournament is usually for nine balls, usually about 25 to 30 percent for the, a break and run percentage for a pro. Um, so for an A player, a B player, a C player, it's going to be far less than that. Um, and that means that when the pros are playing a typical race to nine, if they're winning nine games, they're usually only breaking and running about two or three of those. So the other six games they win have to come through kind of an exchange of, of safety play or possibly their opponent misses and they, you know, leave a fortunate shot or something like that. But the safety play is, is very critical to being able to kind of turn the tables on your opponent and to maintain control of the table as well. Um, talk a little bit about kind of some of the principles of safety play. The first goal in an ideal world would be to uh, to hide the person directly behind a ball so let's say you're shooting at the one ball and somehow you're able to leave the one ball right there you know and there's a let's say there's a few uh, it doesn't matter if you're playing eight ball nine ball let's just say you're playing eight ball and there's a few blocking balls up here your your top goal would be to really really uh, kind of jam somebody up and leave somebody like that. Um, not only are you blocking them from seeing the ball and, and blocking them from seeing the entire ball, but you're also taking away possible routes that the cue ball could go. The closer you get to the ball, the more routes you end up kind of taking away. If I leave the ball here, it's still a pretty good shot, but if jump cues are allowed, a lot of people are able to jump over that ball. And I also have the ability to hit that cushion or hit that cushion as opposed to being closer to the ball. But either one of those is acceptable. Um, I know some players I work with, they get too worked up about trying to get super close to the ball because they don't want somebody jumping over the ball. But at the amateur level, most people are not that good with their jump shots. And I'll let somebody jump all day long because they might make one or two in the match, but they're not going to continue to make them and they're not going to continue to get shape. Uh, the pros will do that. Um, again, typically the amateurs are not going to do that. So your, your next uh, kind of best scenario, if you can't completely prevent them from hitting the ball, would be to prevent them from hitting, um, you know, part of the ball. So in other words, you know, something like this, and I can't hit the entire ball, but I can just scoot by the 13 and kind of hit the, maybe the extreme left edge of the one ball. Um, that's usually also a pretty good um, solution as long as hitting that far side of the ball doesn't allow the ball to go in, which a lot of times it won't. So again, if you can kind of take away some options, give them only one or two shots, that, that's also a pretty good, um, pretty good option. Uh, the third thing, and these are kind of in descending order of what ideal would be, the third thing would be just to leave, they can see the whole ball, but they don't have a shot. So again, let's say the ball is, is right here. If I leave the cue ball right here, 
they don't have a shot on the one ball. Now, there is maybe a low percentage bank shot or something like that, but there's not a direct shot into a pocket. So again, most players, you're forcing them to return the safety. They're not going to be able to just pocket the ball and keep going. Hey, Ken, you can go ahead and grab a seat somewhere, either over here or just anywhere. There's some over here, too. So that would be your next option. Um, if you're not, and again, sometimes the table presents itself in a way where playing some of these kind of really lock them up safeties are just not available. Sometimes they're too difficult to get to that position, and you don't want to try so hard to lock up the safety to the point where you end up exposing the ball and leaving a, an easy shot. So a decent alternative is also where the person has a shot, but it's a very difficult shot. So, for instance, if I left a person like this, a good player would probably make it seven or eight, maybe even nine out of ten times at a pro level. But on an amateur level, it's probably 50-50 at best. And so if I leave a difficult shot because of distance, I leave a difficult shot maybe because of the angle. Maybe the ball is here, and I leave the cue ball something like that where again, I can make the ball and run it down the rail, but it's a very extreme angle, so it's going to be very tough to make. Um, another thing would be is even if I leave the ball right out in the middle of the table, but if somehow I'm able to freeze the cue ball to the rail, again, that makes it a very difficult shot. Not only do I have distance, but I have limited cueing because of where I can hit the cue ball. And something people don't often think about, again, if I have a cluster of balls up here, even if I get in front of these balls, um, that's a fairly makeable shot. But if I'm jacked up over a ball like this, or if I can only see maybe the left side of the cue ball, that also makes it very difficult for my opponent to, to return the save. So those are all kind of things to think about. Um, when I look at a safe, I've practiced them a lot. There's, there's things you can try to do, but if, again, if you try to do too much, you can turn like what could have been a lockup safety in 10% of the time to like completely giving them up a free shot. So it's better to make sure that you get a good result if it's one of those first three options instead of just trying something too fancy, which I see a lot of people do. So speaking of kind of getting fancy, um, there is, I have to start this clinic like at 11 or 12 now. <laughs> this is too early for people, myself included sometimes. Um, you want to focus on either the cue ball or the object ball. In general, you want to focus on one more than the other. There are some shots where you have to kind of think about both, and your angle on the object ball is going to dictate the path of the cue ball. But many, many times, you're trying to just put the object ball in a safe location. Uh, if you kind of look at these areas, kind of between these diamonds, kind of draw like kind of a semicircle, anywhere in that area is usually pretty safe. Sometimes you can even go a little bit farther on either side get too far to the pocket or too far out from that, you end up leaving a makeable shot from a lot of different positions. Um, another good safe zone is that same area in the middle of the lawn rails, uh, kind of here. So again, if I leave the ball there and have the cue ball over here somewhere, I'm not leaving a direct shot. They, they might have a bank shot if the, if the path is open, but it's not like leaving the ball here where it's a fairly routine um, cut shot. Now there's other times where focusing on the cue ball is most important. I would say if I had to guess, probably 50 to 60 percent of the time the object ball is going to be much more important, so really focus on that. Probably 20 to 30 percent of the time is where the cue ball is the most important. And that's where, you know, maybe you have a ball like right here, something like this, and if you just kind of stop the cue ball. It doesn't really matter where the object ball goes. I don't really care if it lands anywhere in here as long as I freeze the cue ball right there. The only thing to be careful of when you're doing shots like that is to make sure you don't accidentally pocket the ball. Uh, I even see that at the pro level sometimes. they uh, Usually for them they end up just forgetting or they end up ticking off another ball and going into the pocket. But um, and then there's other shots where, again, if I hit the cube, if I hit the object ball, let's say half full, the cue ball is going to do one thing. If I hit it a quarter full, the cue ball is going to do something else. So I really have to in order to 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 uh, achieve a good shot. And I'm going to show examples of all three of these as we go through um, go through the class. 
One other thing to kind of note is a lot of people when they're playing safe, they automatically want to use spin on the cue ball. Um, so let's just say real quick example, I have a shot like this and I want to put the 12 ball over on this rail in a safe location and I want the cue ball to come this way. A lot of people automatically will just put right English on the cue ball because they want the cue ball to go to the right. And when you start putting English on the cue ball, you're going to reduce the chance of you hitting the object ball correctly and you're just kind of overcomplicating the shot. So I will use English on the cue ball if I'm trying to slow the cue ball down or if I'm trying to speed the cue ball up or sometimes if I'm trying to move the object ball in a certain direction. But in general, you don't really want to use a lot of English when you're playing safe. Um, try to see what you can do with just a center ball hit, you know, maybe a little draw or follow, but stay on the center axis. And again, we'll kind of talk through some examples of that as we, as we go through. Um, one, one reason, hopefully as you guys go through this, I'm going to cover about six or seven common safeties. I think probably 90% of the safeties that you'll play or the safeties you'll see played will probably fall in one of these six or seven categories. Um, and if you take the time to practice these six or seven shots, you, your safety game will go. Uh, it, it'll really take off. Uh, people generally don't practice safeties. When they're beginners, they, they're all worried about fundamentals and making balls and things like that. And safeties are usually something their coach comes up and tells them to do during an APA match or something. Um, we don't, we're not naturally good at playing safe because most of the time when we're playing pool, our object is to put the ball in the pocket. So we don't really pay attention to what that ball would do if it didn't hit the pocket. Um, people have a very bad perception generally of trying to drive the object ball to a specific spot on the table. So if I'm trying to hit this ball, let's say right on this diamond, that is not something that I'm generally doing when I'm playing pool. I'm usually trying to pocket the ball or trying to bank the ball or something. I'm not generally trying to just nudge it and get it to land perfectly there. So it's something you have to practice to develop the speed control and kind of an understanding of blending how the cue ball hits the ball with what how it comes off the rails and things like that. Um, does all that make sense? Any questions so far? Now people that play like one pocket or three cushion, uh, they have a little bit of an advantage over the rest of the pool players because in those games there are a lot of safety plays. There is an emphasis placed on where the object ball goes. So um, you kind of learn those techniques a little bit better. But I think for most eight, nine, ten ball players, uh, it's something that you just have to kind of work at and practice. Mm -hmm. Well, did, did you say that the object ball is more important? So the so the difference there, number one, they play a lot more than than we do. <laughs> but um, I'll show you. I'll just show you like a real quick example. So by the way, I, sorry, I forgot to repeat the question because people can't hear on on online. So the question was that the pros seem to try to hide the cue ball about ninety percent of the time. So. For instance, if I'm playing this kind of a safe, and I'm going to cover this in a minute, but I'm just going to kind of whack away at this real quick. Let's say I have a ball down here. Let's say I even have a couple balls down here um, where I kind of have a way to, to block the ball, right? So I may want to hit this one ball down over here somewhere and have the cue ball come here, here, and back over here somewhere, right, to kind of block it. And that's great. However, if I focus so hard on getting the cue ball here and I miss a little, the cue ball could come out to here and the object ball, because I didn't pay attention to it, could land right here. So that's what I'm saying where they're already taking care of the object ball. They already know the object ball is going to land here. And then they put something on the cue ball, certain speed, certain thickness of hit, certain spin to try to get the cue ball back here. So you're right, you know, if I'm hitting a shot like this, you know, I'm trying to hide the cue ball, but I want to take care of my object ball because if I hit this shot poorly, I hit that one good, if I get it out here, I still didn't leave a shot. But if I don't know how to play that safe, and let's say I hit it a little too thick, 
and I'm trying to get up there, now I have something that looks like that. And if I don't again land here, let's say I bumped into this ball on the way on the way forward, something like that. Now again I left a shot. So so yeah, it's kind of a subtle point, and you're right. I, I do the same thing when I'm playing. I'm trying to I tend to think about the cue ball hiding from the object ball, not the object ball hiding from the cue ball. But you have to blend both things in order to in order to make that work. <coughs> just so I don't forget to talk about it later, um, I want to just talk a little bit about eight ball. I know a lot of people watching, a lot of people here play eight ball. Uh, I try not to that much myself, but I, I still do. Um, it's a little bit different. Obviously, games like straight pool and one pocket have their own kind of specialty safes because you can hit any ball on the table. So there's some different things you do with those games. But an eight ball, it's usually pretty tough to play safe and prevent your opponent from seeing like every one of their balls that are left on the table. Uh, usually the only way you can do that is if you freeze up like right on a ball uh, you know so maybe someone has solids you know sitting out here like this you know if I have a scenario like that yes I can play safe but those scenarios tend to not come up very often so a lot of times what I'm trying to do is just I'm trying to look at all the shots the person has available and maybe just trying to freeze the cue ball up on a rail or you know leave them a really long shot like something on the four ball just hoping that the person's going to miss but all the principles i'm going to cover today all the shots are still relevant it's just that you can't sometimes you have to be very very particular when you're playing safe in, in eight ball and one of the things i read a long time ago in one of my uh one of my favorite eight ball books was it talked about the failed run out and i mean and that's something i used to be guilty of when i was younger is you start just kind of taking balls off the table and you keep going and then pretty soon you kind of work yourself into a into a trap and there's you've got two balls left or one ball left or worse yet just the eight ball left and now your opponent has all of their balls on the table at, especially at a high level of the game you are going to lose that game almost every single time you might get lucky at an amateur intermediate level but uh, at a high level if you have that failed run out which happens occasionally but if you do it because you didn't plan properly or you tried to get too aggressive toward the end of the rack you're, you're going to lose so if you don't have a plan to run out you don't have an easy way to get from ball to ball toward the end of the rack it's much better to just make three balls two balls maybe even one ball and and do something to improve your position at the table um, you know, create a cluster for your opponent, bump a ball in front of the pocket, free up one of your clustered balls. Don't, you know, a lot of times I see people put some stripes out here. I see people with something like this, right? And so they're shooting stripes, and they've got a little problem over there. And, you know, first thing I'll see them do is shoot that 15 ball. I mean, that's literally the only ball on the table that's really going to help you break those balls out. And the first thing I see is they shoot that ball. And then they come around the table, and they might shoot this ball and that ball. And then they try some hero shot at the end, and they try to make that ball and kind of come off that rail and bump into them. And they either miss the balls, or they get tucked behind a ball, or they miss that ball trying to break those out. So again, I'm going to try to maneuver myself in a position so that I can make, I can break those balls out early. And if I don't break them out early, then I'm not generally going to try to run out the rack. Now again, the better player you are, the more you make something happen. But at an amateur level, it's usually a pretty easy way to, um, to miss. Um, one other kind of specialty thing I want to show you guys, I see a lot of people can't do this but in some of the other leagues um, they like to make balls and call safe and I've probably seen two or three examples in my whole career playing pool where that was actually a good idea and I probably see people do it ten times a night when they're when they're playing league again APA you can't do it because it's slop counts and if the ball goes in it's it is what it is but you never want to take balls off the table I always think of them like soldiers right and if you start taking your soldiers off the table then you, you you limit your options later 
I've seen people, you know, let's just say that this was a shot of mine and I don't know, let's just say I have a ball like this and I want to be smart and slick and I'm going to call safe and make that ball and stick the cue ball right there. That might be, you know, a good shot, but a better shot would be to maybe miss the four a little bit and leave it in front of the pocket so I still have an option to make the ball and then I can still, you know, play the safe. I, I still kept my ball on the table. You know, it doesn't matter where it lands. I have an extra ball that I can do something with later. The other thing you can do sometimes, if you have a little shot like this, and you're looking at this, and let's just say, uh, you know, again, it looks something like this, and let's just say the eight ball is, I don't know, in a bad spot, and you don't think you can get down there to, to get the eight ball. So another thing you can do sometimes is just to hit this ball really, really super thin and really soft and just tuck the cue ball behind the ball. So I'll see if I can do it because I don't ever really hit these kind of shots. Okay, something like that. So rather than me jack up, try to put a lot of spin on the ball and try to fly around the table and hopefully get on this eight, if I can just freeze the cue ball back there, there's a really good chance I'm going to get ball in hand and then I can put the cue ball where I want it for the angle I want and, and proceed to run out. And that kind of shot comes up a good amount and it's a good shot to know. And again, you just kind of have to practice from different angles and get used to the speed and the spin and everything you need and how thick you need to hit it. But if you can do something like that pretty repetitively, it's, it's a pretty good It's one of the few ways you can almost always block the person from seeing the rest of their, the rest of their balls. All right. So I'm going to kind of cover the, uh, what I think at least are the six or seven different types of safeties. And these are probably in order of, um, I wouldn't say order of frequency, but probably in the order that I, you know, you might cycle through them in your head um, when you're kind of determining what you're going to do. So the first one is just a kind of a stop shot safety. So, and again, some of these examples, I'm just going to kind of do it free form. I like to do it that way so it's kind of realistic. I'll probably miss a couple and have to shoot them again. Um, but so don't, don't worry about the fact that some of these balls might actually go in a pocket. We'll, we'll assume that like a shot like this, there might be balls blocking the pockets or something. So this would be kind of the simplest one, and this would just be where you can hit a stop shot. Now you have to be, I've talked whole clinics on stop shots. I'll probably do one again when this series is over. It's a very important shot. So a lot of people, when they hit their stop shots, they hit them too hard. And so if I hit this as a stop shot, the way most people do, right, what happens? A six ball comes flying around, and I, I have a shot on it. So you have to be able to hit a stop shot at a softer speed. So you have to go down lower on the cue ball and put a little draw on the ball and you kind of soften up the hit a little bit so that there's enough backspin on the ball so it's not spinning backwards or forwards. So I'm just going to drop down about a tip. I even miscued and still got it. <laughs> um, so you can see the difference in in the movement of the six ball. It didn't didn't move very far. Now, if I have a long distance to cover, it can be tough to kind of stop to stop it. So if I was like this far away, I have to really go pretty low and hit this pretty pretty soft to keep that six from traveling too far. You can see even there, I, I, I got it, but it's only because I stuck it like right behind the eight. So again, sometimes when that shot's available, um, you just have to be aware of the distance and being able to kind of hit the ball soft enough to stop it and also keep it where you're trying to keep it. Um, another similar shot would be just kind of softly rolling the cue ball. So this takes a little practice as far as judging the angles and everything, but this would be if I'm trying to roll the six down on the end rail and just softly roll the cue ball up behind the eight. Okay, so just something like that. Um, and again, that just takes a little bit of practice to be able to judge the hit. 
Uh, I see a lot of people, they don't practice it, so when they try to do it, they hit it too soft and the six never hits a rail and they end up uh, fouling, or they hit the cue ball too hard and ends up over here. So I recommend a lot of times, you know, just setting the balls up and just, you know, kind of practicing. And just get the get that touch down and get that feel down for where you want to set it. The, the game you're playing is nine ball? I, I'm just showing examples right now. But in general with nine ball, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, with rotation games, it's a little bit easier because we're both shooting at the same lowest numbered ball on the table. Again, if I was playing eight ball, that may or may not be an effective save depending on where the other person's balls are. It's a little bit easier to show it in, in terms of rotation. Uh, and again, like I said, in eight ball, you see safeties played, but usually it's more strategic safeties where, again, blocking pockets, uh, things like that. You don't usually see a lot of safeties where you're uh, where your opponent's able to hide you from your remaining five or six or seven balls. Another similar safety to this, I'll come around this way, would be something like this, where I'm down here, and again, I've kind of got this blocking ball right here by the rail, and I just want to roll the cue ball softly over here behind the eight. So I'm going to just kind of do that same thing, just trying to kind of judge the speed and just do that. And again, these are very simple, very easy safeties, but you have to be able to practice them to get the proper feel. One thing to think about, so kind of a little trick, if you're ever in a situation like this, where the cue ball's roughly in this area and you want to try to hide the six from the cue ball, if you hit about half of the ball, the balls are going to travel in about the same speed. So if I hit about half of this six ball, so I aim the center of the cue ball right at the edge of that six, if I can hit it with the right speed to send the six to the rail, the cue ball is also going to end up on the rail. So again, this is one where I don't have to think so much about both balls. I just think about one or the other getting it to the rail. So I'm going to aim right from the middle of the cue ball right at the edge of that six. Right, and you can see they both traveled about the same distance. Uh, the cue ball may be slightly less because of the collision, but that's a really good way to visualize shots like that. I remember I used to try to get too touchy sometimes on shots like that, and um, it's real easy to, to end up hitting the cue ball a little too hard or a little too soft. So to me, all of those would be considered kind of the first category of safety. Basically where you're, you're stopping the ball or rolling it a short distance to hide it behind a ball. And again, the best way to do this is just to, again, in the context of, uh, context of nine ball, you know, when you're practicing, you can just kind of take ball in hand and, uh, You know, just kind of practice, you know, practice hiding it behind balls. You know, it doesn't even matter what the shot is. Um, you know, I might have something like this, and I want to try to hide the person on the seven ball. You know, just, again, just kind of practice the speed and everything that you need to try to, to, try to hide the ball. It's kind of a stroke you don't use that much playing pool, which is why you have to practice it a little bit. The next category, I kind of call them the side-to-side -side shots. And this ends up being a little bit more of a containing safety usually, where you're just trying to prevent the person from having an easy shot. And a lot of times you're leaving it completely open. Um, matter of fact, this is a great example. You'll see people do this sometimes when they're on the nine ball. And especially if you're playing on a tight table, most people would just try to bank this ball, but like on a diamond table or on this table, which is a pro cut table, you have to hit that ball almost perfectly clean for it to go in. You can't hit it down here or here or here. So the bank shot is pretty difficult. The cut's pretty difficult. And if you're in a tough situation and you're against an opponent that you don't think can fire back at you, sometimes the best option is to play safe and let them make the mistake first. So when you're in about this position where that ball's about a diamond away, and the cue ball's roughly even with it or maybe a little bit to the right. Again, if you hit about half of the ball 
and just focus on your speed, the balls are going to kind of come back about the same distance. And they should both land roughly around the second diamond. So again, I'm hitting this about half a ball, no, no English. Okay. So again, that would be a pretty decent result. I kept them kind of in the middle of the table. If you get a little too far up here or a little too far down here, sometimes the bank shot's a lot easier. Where if you leave it kind of in the middle of the table, this is a dip more difficult bank than, say, if I left the person, you know, like that. What I recommend for these, there's infinite varieties of these types of shots. The ball could be anywhere. But the goal is you're trying to put one ball on that rail, somewhere between the first and third diamond usually, and you're trying to put the cue ball somewhere over here. If you can freeze one or both balls, that's kind of a bonus. Now you can see, if I, just for this one example, if I move the cue ball over here a little bit, I can hit almost the same shot. I'm still going to aim right down the center of the nine ball. And again, just a rolling ball, no, no English or anything. And you can see I got pretty much the same result. The cue ball didn't come all the way over to the rail because I wasn't on that 50-50 line, but they both came up to about the same spot. So I really didn't have to change the way I cued the cue ball at all. Now, if I get over here too far, number one, I'd probably make the ball, <laughs> but if there was something blocking it or whatever, now you'll see I won't be able to do the same thing. If I hit, if I hit directly half a ball, Still not bad, but you can see that now the nine ball is starting to move more than the cue ball. So this still isn't horrible. And again, if it's a containing safety, maybe that's something I want to do. Um, so what I recommend again is, to, is uh, you know, if you practice for five minutes every time you practice and just put the ball in a specific position and move the cue ball into different positions and just kind of see what it does. Hit it half full, hit it three quarters full, hit it a quarter full. Those are kind of your three main guidelines that you can use to establish what the cue ball is going to do. And you can start to build up that sense of that cue ball object ball relationship and where the balls are going to go. Um, same thing if I'm on this side of the ball. If I hit half a ball now, it's going to be more like a bank shot coming up this way toward the pocket. I'm not going to be able to get that, that safety with that same hit. It also changes if the ball gets closer to the rail. So if I'm close to the rail like that, and I put myself in that same position, if I hit half a ball now, because of the closeness to the rail, it's going to be much more like a bank shot. Okay? So sometimes you will see uh, better players play safe to where they can control the ball landing right about here, and that's still usually a pretty good safe because it's leaving a very tough cut shot, but it's also very touchy. You could hit the point and leave the ball right in front of the side pocket hit it too soft and leave it in front of the side pocket. So again, I know from experience kind of some, you know, most of the time anyways, it becomes kind of a feel thing. But when you're left with a shot like that, you just have to assess the situation and you have to know that, okay, if I do this, it's not going to work. And sometimes we guess and sometimes we guess wrong. Um, I know for a shot like this, I would have to hit this more like a quarter full, so a much thinner shot and probably put a little bit of left English on the cue ball to get it to slow down as well. And so it would look, hopefully, something like this. Right, trying to leave it kind of, again, on that 50-yard line. And it's very difficult on that shot to get both balls frozen just because it, it's not going to it's not going to go that way unless you hit it absolutely perfect. And again, here I left a f somewhat easy bank but, you know, maybe there's a ball in the way or something. Um, and that's another thing that happens. I see these safeties a lot of times. You know, I might have some balls over here like this. And so, you know, having this safety now, again, remember what I said before, I want to focus on the object ball. I don't want to try to get the cue ball behind these balls so intently that I just lose sight of the nine ball and end up leaving it in front of the pocket or something. So... I am going to hi try to hide the cue ball, but I'm also going to take care of the nine ball at the same time. And that's going to be my kind of my primary goal. Okay, so that's a perfect example. I did get 
over a ball, which is good, but I didn't land exactly here. I didn't land exactly there, which would have been really nice. Um, but I took care of the ball. If I tried so hard to get here, then maybe what happens is that ball ends up coming up like that, and I find the gap, and I end up leaving a shot. So if you take care of the object ball, the cue ball is a bonus if it lands behind one of the balls. Does that make any questions on that type of safety? It comes up a lot. Kevin Chim is one of my buddies. He is annoyingly good at that shot. I can put the balls just about anywhere. I can leave him down here frozen to the rail and he will find a way to put that nine ball directly frozen to that diamond and put the cue ball like right here. It's crazy, but I think that's all he does all day is practice those shots. So I actually learned from watching him. I mean, I was a pretty good safety player already, but it's, it's interesting to watch him attack the shots. He keeps it very simple. He's not using three tips of inside English or anything crazy. It's just percentage of the object ball being hit and speed, and that's it. So th that's the second type of safety. Again, it's going to come up uh, frequently. So another type of safety is kind of similar, but it's end-to-end. -end. So instead of leaving them side-to-side, -side, we're going to leave the balls end-to-end. -end. And again, we kind of have our safe zone here, about a diamond high here and kind of a semicircle coming back to these, to these two diamonds. So when you have a shot like this, let's just say it's somewhere like here. So I already have kind of the perfect angle that's pointing me somewhere up in this area. So all I have to do is hit the ball almost full in the face with the right speed to get it to land somewhere here. So that would look something like this. I hit that a little hard, felt it as soon as I hit it. So you can see if I hit it a little hard, it's going to come all the way out and, and leave a shot. Try that one more time. And again, these shots become a little more difficult when you add distance. Um, or if there's kind of a funny angle. I hate that one pretty bad though. And then usually that's what happens afterwards is you hit it too soft. <laughs> one more time. Okay, so you can see it's a little bit of a touchy shot. It requires some finesse and some speed, especially if you start to get on these outer edges of the ball. If I happen to land that closer to here, which I would normally would have put a little inside English on it, then if I land maybe here, it's still kind of okay. A lot of times these shots, when they come up, they're actually crossing over the ball. So a lot of times you don't have that perfect bank angle. It looks something more like this. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to hit the ball right in the face as I'm cutting across it so that it banks kind of straight up into this area. And this is one where I uh, don't worry about the cue ball really too much at all um, because if I try to get too fancy, try to get the cue ball frozen to the rail, it's probably going to result in me hitting this ball too hard. So again, same shot, just cutting across it. I'm trying to aim full in the face of the ball. Okay, and I'm trying to get it up there, and that's a pretty good shot. I mean, ideally, I'd like it be right here, but somewhere like that's pretty good. Now, again, occasionally, there might be some balls over here or something. So, I may, I may slightly change my path of the object ball and the speed that I'm hitting the cue ball at and the spin I'm using to try to get behind the four. But again, I'm going to try to do it in a way where I'm not going to expose the three ball if I miss. So just trying to blend those things. I'm going to use a little bit of inside English on this shot and a little bit of follow. Oop, man. Um, it depends. Um, that's why I said before, like some of these scenarios, maybe, like if I had this shot, I'm, no, I'm not going to try to cut that ball. I could, and again, if I, I forgot to mention this earlier. So at my level, right, if I shoot that ball, it's like a 60 to a 70 degree cut. 
if I try to shoot it in that pocket, or even I could make it in that pocket, I'm probably just realistically, everyone has uh, what I call like performance amnesia, right? They remember all the times they made that ball, and somehow we managed to forget all the times we missed it, right? I'll have people come to me, they're maybe B players, and they'll say, oh yeah, I make that ball 8 out of 10. BS. <laughs> okay? Uh, if I'm shooting well, and I have to shoot that shot, and I'm not saying that exact shot, because if I shoot that exact shot, I can start to use secondary aim points and get a very good sight picture and, and really nail in on it. I'm saying a shot like that, where maybe one time it's here, one time the ball's here, one time it's here, you know, one time the cue ball's just in that range, right? So you have to re-aim every time. If I shoot that, I'm probably six or seven out of ten. And that's just low enough where I don't want to shoot that shot in a game. My, my personal kind of mental note is probably about 70%. Now there's players in town that play like me that are a little more aggressive, and you're right, they probably load it up with two tips outside spin and try flying around the table and make the ball, and that's fine for them. Um, for me, I have, I think, a good blend between being aggressive and being defensive, and if I think I can play the safety 80% of the time, or 90% of the time, I'd rather shoot that than shoot that 60 or 70% shot. I think for beginning players, the percentage can be lower, because you're not going to get hurt as bad if you miss. Your opponent generally is not going to run out, and they're certainly not going to run out and then run out the next rack. At my level, if I'm playing, if I take a flyer at this and leave the person a shot, I, I may not shoot for 10 or 15 minutes again. Or I may shoot, but I may not like what I'm coming to the table to shoot at. I think one of my best matches, it wasn't the best I ever played by far, but it was my best match as far as mentally, and I wish I could recapture that one of these days. I played in the finals of the U.S. Amateur, and my opponent, we were playing a race to 11. It was supposed to be a combination of 9 and 8 ball. So we played 13 games of 9 ball and 8 games of 8 ball. And we chose 9 ball first. I won the leg. He didn't have a reasonable shot to shoot at until the score was 9-0. I didn't run 9 racks, but I ran 2 and then played safe. And then I ran another one and played safe. And maybe I played safe twice in a game, but I was more patient than I've ever been. I, any shot that, I wasn't super conservative and just playing safe at every turn, but the tough shots I had to make, I made, which helped. <laughs> and um, any time I was feeling a little funky in a shot, I just locked him up. And so he was, you know, if his shot was the three ball, he was shooting at shots like that for nine racks. By the time he finally got to the table and he, and he kicked the ball and lucked it in, and he won that game, it was the only game he won. He never, you know, he was so, and, and you see the pros, that's how they play. I mean, they're, they're aggressive, they're shot makers, they want to retain control of the table, but they're not afraid to play a defensive shot as well to get control back in that manner. So, that, yeah. From a, from a mindset shooting pool, in that atmosphere, you can maybe, by you playing good save, can frustrate them where they come out of their comfort zone and confidence. Does that make sense? Yeah, so the question was, again, like, frustrating a person by playing safe. Now, again, there's a few players in town that I feel are, they're good players, but I feel they're a little too conservative. And, and they do frustrate their opponents, and they do win matches because of it. Um, I've learned that doesn't bother me. I, I love to kick at balls, and that's next class, by the way. Um, I know probably 30 or 40 kicking systems, and I, I used to play three cushion a lot, and I love it. So I don't care how bad you've got me locked up, I'm gonna take it as a challenge to try to hit the ball. Uh, and if they play a good save, I tap my cue on the table and say good shot and let them go from there. But people do let it frustrate them. They get frustrated if they can't shoot at an open shot for five or six shots. And then they tend to push a little harder on the next shot. And that, that's exactly right. So, again, if I had a shot like this on an easy table, I might try to bank it and play two rail shape on the four. But more often than not, I'm going to get the best results by just playing safe. And again, I, th I think from here, and it's a little, always a little tougher when I'm not in rhythm and not and talking, but I think from here I would expect to get that three back up here and get the cue ball close to that four, you know, try to get that controlled up here. And again, on a good day, you know, if I hit the shot good, it, I also get the bonus of getting the cue ball. But like I said before, it's very important not to try to do this at the exclusion of that. There's even kind of a little specialty shot that comes up sometimes.
See if I can kind of come up with a shot. Again, something like this. And a lot of times, you know, you, you see normally when I hit these shots, the cue ball wants to come over this way. But if you put a lot of inside English on it and you pinch the ball just right, you can actually get it to slow down quite a bit. And so again, this shot would be very difficult if the person left me up here, uh, which is why when you play safe, leaving the cue ball near the rail and leaving it with distance is, increases your chances of getting the, the table back. But with something like this, if I pinch the ball just right, I can get the three ball up here, but also potentially hide the person behind a nine ball. And this requires kind of maximum uh, left English in this case. And that, the only danger with that is exactly that. And that's okay. Usually when you get a double kiss like that, it actually tends to work out okay. Okay, so something like that. I actually used too much spin on that. But you can see how I was able to slow the cue ball down quite a bit. Still took care of this. And if I used a little less English, I actually could have done that with the nine ball here, which would have been a but a lot of times the cue ball will land there, and then again you just kind of get a bonus out of it. But I always pay attention to this. Okay, another shot that comes up a lot is kind of sending the object ball or the cue ball down to the end rail. So I, think I shot one of these really quickly before. So that would be when you have something like this. You've got an object ball on the rail. And the cue ball is roughly in line with it, you know, somewhere between, like, say, here and here. So what you can do is cut this 7, kind of in that semicircle on the end rail, and send the cue ball somewhere up table. Um, again, it doesn't matter that much where the cue ball goes as your priority 1. Priority 1 is to get the object ball to this rail. Generally, you probably want to hit the ball about a quarter full. Um, so you're aiming the edge of the ball at the right quarter of the ball if, if you aim that way or if you just visualize it. That's about the thickness you're trying to hit. Um, and then again, it's just speed from there. All right, so something like that. And a lot of times, just like our side-to-side -side shot we shot before, the balls will end up kind of in a line uh, lengthwise on the table. But again, my priority is not where this cue ball lands. My priority is to get that seven ball down there. Now, if I have some balls here, or I have some balls here, I may do some I may do some different things to try to get the cue ball um, behind. So, if, say I'm trying to get behind these, and I, if I see the angle right, I may try to hit the ball maybe just a touch thinner, or use a little bit of right English, whatever feels right, to try to uh, get get that a little bit better. Okay, so I just missed them, but again, took care of that ball, and if I didn't quite get here, that's okay. I don't even sit down and get frustrated about it or anything. It was just kind of a bonus if I got there. And then if the balls were like kind of over here, I know that on some of these shots, it's going to be hard for me to hit the seven, I mean, sorry, to hit the cue ball hard enough to get over there without also exposing the seven down by the pocket. So I have to be really clear that I have the right angle to do this type of shot before I try to do it. And I'm just going to try to hit this a little bit thinner. Okay, so you can see I kind of tried to speed up the cue ball, but when it hit this rail, it kind of took off. But again, I almost have the same result every time. So if I leave that ball there, my chance of getting a return valid safety for my opponent is pretty slim because it's very difficult to precisely hit that ball from eight feet away or nine feet away where if I left them here, I have a lot more options, a uh, lot more chance for precision, just because you're closer to the ball, you can see it um, better. I, ideally, if I freeze the cue ball, I mean, that's it's really taking away options then. So again, I highly recommend that you practice these two rail safes. Um, practice them from different parts of the table. Uh, one good way to estimate, let's say I'm up here somewhere, I usually I'll try to pick, if I want the ball to land roughly in the middle here, I'll try to pick like a mirror location. Like so if you can imagine there's another table sort of flipped over here, I'll try to picture where that middle diamond would be on this 
kind of ghost table, if that makes sense. And I kind of look down that line, because if I hit that spot, it's going to hit that rail and kind of come back off over here. It's kind of a mirror principle, and we'll talk about that a little bit when we talk about kicking. So if I look right here, I can almost bring my stick over like this and know that when I hit the ball, that it's going to land at that right angle. So it's a good way of estimating it if you're not familiar with how thick or how thin to hit the ball. Somet sometimes people are just good at looking at it, and that's fine too. Um, you know, you can, again, you can sit up here and just kind of look and say, okay, what angle do I need to hit it at? The mistake I find most people make is they're automatically used to banking the ball, and so they tend to leave the ball too close over here. And if I, if I leave this ball like this, and the cue ball is right here, well, oops, then yes, I'm going to probably shoot at that ball. Because the safety is just as difficult as the shot, and so I'd much rather shoot at the ball. And especially as the cue ball starts to come over here, then it's a, fr it's a pretty repeatable shot. The only way the person gets away with that shot is if somehow the cue ball got left over here or something. Now, if you end up too far above the ball, like this, and again, I know this is a makeable shot, but let's just say, let's say we're in a game of nine ball and this ball is kind of in a bad spot for a combination or whatever, and um, so I don't want to try the combo or whatever. If I'm up above the ball like this, I'm not going to be able to hit the top side of the ball and get the cue ball to come all the way up here and send the six ball down there. The two things just are not congruent. They won't happen together. So I have a couple options. One would be just to softly bunt the six ball down to the end rail and just, again, try to like shoot to live another day, so to speak. You know, nothing, nothing fancy, just sort of, you know, something like that. And again, you have to be careful. You don't want it to leak out too much. You don't want it to be over here a little bit too much because then they'll have a, a cut at it. The other shot, which I like shooting, um, is a four rail safe. And um, so rather than just bunt the ball like that, you can hit this. And again, this just requires a little bit of judgment on speed and angle. Okay, you can kind of send the ball back up this way. And if that ball wasn't there, you know, the ball would have looked like kind of right around in here. So, and that's actually not too, uh, not too difficult. Um, I actually had one like this, uh, probably something like this the other day. I don't remember the exact situation. But I had the perfect angle that I saw, and the nice thing was I was able to just hit a little bit of follow on the cue ball. So the same exact shot, I just put a little follow on the cue ball and got it to kind of hide behind the nine. And again, I was taking care of the six. You know, being able to do something like that and, and possibly bring the nine ball into play, it was worth a little extra spin a little extra speed just to try to do that but again I'm taking care of this so so far most of the shots I'm shooting um, I'm really focusing on the object ball because if I make a mistake with that my turn you know game could be over if I make a stick make a mistake with the cue ball a little bit it's usually not horrible on these types of shots any questions so far on these I think four categories So another one of my favorite shots is the two railer. So we've talked about like side to side and end to end. And then, oh, I forgot one thing, sorry. I forgot to go the other way. So that, that's what you do if you're above the ball. Uh, the other thing you can do is if you're below the ball like this, is sending this ball um, two rails back up to that rail. So it's kind of the same shot. Generally, if you look at this line between the pocket and a, a little bit above the third diamond, it's going to bank a little bit above the second diamond and it'll reverse and kind of land right about there. So that's kind of your reference line, if you will. So when I, when I look at a shot like that, I'm just a little shy of it. So I'm going to Okay. 
Okay. So again, very easy save. You can see how soft I hit it. I'm taking care of my object ball. I may adjust my cue ball spin and speed based on where these balls are. If I have some other balls down here, um, you know, somewhere like here or here, and I have that same shot or something similar, right? I may, I may try to put a little left English on the ball, maybe hit it a little thicker and try to get the cue ball to spin down here and get behind the five or, but, but again, I'm not going to do that at the expense of messing with the six ball. So I'm going to try to feel the difference that it's going to take to get down there. Right. So even there, I kind of let the six ball loose a little bit. It's not bad, but it's a little farther out than I would have liked it. And it was all get, you know, back here. Um, so you have to weigh the options and the situation and everything and see how kind of fancy you want to get with that. The other shot you can do, and people don't always see this one, maybe there's balls in the way and you can't uh, two rail bank it. Another shot that's, uh, that I like, let me reverse these just so it makes a little more sense, is to cut this ball, just to cut it one rail up to the middle of the end rail. Now, a lot of times people don't realize that if I hit this ball thin enough, it's, it, you know, I can just cut it right to here. And again, I use the same principle. So I'll stand back here and I kind of like picture where my middle of my ghost table is. And if I see it right there, I can see kind of where I need to hit. The if you want to walk your stick around, that's fine. Or if you just want to visualize it. But I hit that a little too soft. But you can see it's tracking up there pretty pretty nicely. Right. So you can see anything like that. I have a ball back there. I have a pretty good result. And again, I'm going to focus on this, but a lot of times a lot of times there is another ball down here somewhere and um if I'm underneath like this, I can choose to go two rails and get behind it. Or sometimes if the ball is like, say, over here, I might be able to kill the ball just enough and, and try to get back that way. But again, I'm always trying to take care of that first. So the next category would be kind of a two rail safe. Um, a lot of times people try this shot when there's like, say, a ball here. Of the cue ball somewhere like this. And they'll try to cut the five so that it goes here and here. And they'll try to bring the cue ball around the table, either two or three rails, and try to get the cue ball back in here. Um, that's a pretty good shot, pretty powerful shot. You have to make sure that the speed, this is one where you have to control both the object ball and the cue ball. Um, if I just try to put the object ball here, my cue ball may land over here. And if I try to get my cue ball here, the object ball may come out and, and land out here. So I have to kind of blend the two together. And the only way to get uh, proficient at this is practice and, and feeling the difference, again, the angles, the speed, and the spin. Um, there's a little plus two system. I'll go over that next time for kicking. It helps for me to visualize like how thick I need to hit that ball to get down here. So on a shot like this, I probably would just come two rails and I'd want to come in maybe just right in here. And so I can kind of see how where I need to hit the ball. And again, speed's going to be very important. And you can see on a shot like this, there is a very, very small window to get a safety. So I see a lot of people, this is kind of their go-to move when they have safeties. And unless you've got like a whole strain of balls here, it's very difficult to get this to land like that. So again, I, I see it as the go-to move for a lot of people because they kind of see that shot. Um, and if I have a single ball like that, it's probably not necessarily the safety I'm gonna play. One good way to practice these is to set up maybe two balls, a little more realistic as far as the um, like a blocking and try to get the cue ball back behind here. Um, and so again, I'm going to kind of visually look and figure out where I need to hit to kind of come into this diamond so that I can float over there. 
and try to figure out how thick I want to hit the ball and speed and spin. So I under hit that a little bit. And this will actually turn out okay because again I might be jacked up over a ball. And the tendency with these shots in general is to hit them a little bit too thick. It's a little bit better. Okay, so of course usually for me that's what happens is I split the balls and leave the person a shot, but you know, try. So again, a good way to practice these is just to kind of move the balls up a little bit more. You know, it doesn't matter where the five ball is or where that other ball is. It's good to kind of just randomly place it so that, again, you get used to kind of re-aiming the shot every single time. So now I know I need to come in more from here. So I'm going to try to visualize what angle I have to be able to do that. And probably about the same speed and about the same amount of spin. I think I just made the ball. So pretty close. But again, if you practice these types of shots, five minutes, ten minutes, don't wear yourself out. Don't sit there and try to do it for an hour. It's probably counterproductive if you do that. But take all these different categories of shots and just try different things. Try to hit it an eighth full, a quarter full, half full. Try different speeds, different amounts of spins, and just pay attention to what the cue ball does and see if you can uh, you know, hide behind a set of balls or place that object ball in the right, you know, in the right location. Okay, the kind of the last major one that I want to talk about is the thin hit safety. This is another one that looks really impressive when the uh when the pros do it, and it's very difficult especially at distance. So, if you're something like this, it doesn't really matter where the other balls are got a couple different options here but one of the options is to try to hit that nine ball super super thin this might even be a good situation in a nine ball game where that's your last shot and you have an off angle bank it's frozen to the rail you have really no cut shot on it so you just don't want to sell out the game so one of the things to do you could play the side to side safe but again you might leave your opponent a bank kind of a free bank even or you might hit it bad and leave it in front of the side pocket. So one thing you can do is just hit it super thin and leave the nine ball right there and just send the cue ball around the table and leave them really long. So you have to kind of take a minute and just kind of make sure you're going to hit the ball. Our tendency is to try to hit this ball too thick because we're afraid of missing. I'd almost rather miss the ball completely than hit it, you know, a quarter full because if I hit it too full, it's going to definitely hit off this rail and sit right in front of the pocket. So I'm left eye dominant, so a lot of times even when I get down on this shot, I'll close my right eye so that my left eye is very purely seeing that line between the edges of the ball. A good way to aim this is to line up the inside edge of the cue ball to the outside edge of the nine, and just kind of parallel your stick over and shoot down that center line. Because um, again, you want to shoot it pretty thin. It was a little thicker than I wanted, and I'm probably going to scratch. I <laughs> wasn't paying attention to that. And you do have to pay attention to that. So for me, if I hit this, I'm probably going to use some right English so that I bring the ball into here and, and back over to the rail. And that complicates the hit a little bit. But something like that would be what I would normally do. And again, I hit it just a little thicker than I wanted. Uh, with practice, you can get that nine ball to almost barely move. Um, but it's still acceptable result. What I see people doing a lot is they, once they learn that safety, and I have students that I've done three or four two-hour lessons on just safeties over a period of time, and I notice they kind of develop a preference for certain safeties. So when they play in a game, it's like their go-to safety. Like no matter where the balls are, they're going to go end-to-end -end or side-to-side -side, no matter what, no matter what position the balls are in. So I have one student that loves the thin hit safeties. And I'm telling you right now, I would not want to bet my life on hitting that ball super thin from this far away. I could do it. You give me enough tries. Uh, I can't even see that far right now. So, I mean, trying to hit that super thin from here would just be so difficult. It would not be what I would try to do. 
That's normally what's going to happen. And I didn't even try to do what I would normally do. And I got a little lucky that I left them close to the rail and left a long shot. Uh, that is a missable shot because of the distance, and most people are going to have to kind of elevate a little bit. But I, if that's all I have left, I'm probably going to spend more time over that shot than I would the most difficult shot I could shoot. Because I'm, I'm just going to make sure I really, really, really am locked in. Because I know that's the normal result. So for me, I try to go like kind of edge to edge. And then I almost go over even a little bit more. If I hit it, I would be pretty happy. If I hit it correctly. Yeah, see, it's just so easy. Your, your brain does not want to miss that ball. So it's so easy to hit it like that. So again, that's where kind of the end-to-end -end safety is better. Even putting them side to side is better. Uh, two railing the ball up here is better in my opinion, when you're this far away. Now, again, if you if you did nothing but for five or ten minutes each practice session, worked on hitting that ball super thin, you would uh, you would get good at it and you feel confident with it. So I think I think that's it. That that would be kind of the six or seven common safeties. And like I said, the best way to practice it, I'll kind of show you. Um, can be kind of boring sometimes to do to practice uh, and just set up shots so you can you can break the balls or you can just kind of throw them out whatever you want to do and I don't know how many people here kind of play against the ghosts but if you play the ghost in eight ball or nine ball you're basically basically racking the balls you break you take ball in hand and you try to run out and if you run out you get a point and if you miss the ghost gets a point basically the ghost never misses right so for an a player kind of the sign of an a player if you're playing nine ball is that you're able to beat the ghost in nine ball you're able to win more games than you lose you know so uh, a medium a player might beat the ghost if they're playing to seven like seven to six or seven to five like they barely beat it a strong a player probably more like seven to two or seven to three a pro is probably going to be like seven to one you're usually making balls on the break and you're really playing seven or eight ball um, I see people practice the eight ball goes sometimes. That's a good idea too, good idea as well. So do the same thing with safety play. So you can take ball in hand and your goal is to play a safe. And if you prevent the ghost from seeing the ball, any part of the ball, you get a point. If you play like a containing safety where they can see the ball but they don't have a makeable shot, it's just kind of a push. And then if they have a makeable shot, the ghost gets a point. And so you can kind of play this with a partner or you can play on your own and play up to a certain number of points. And then the nice thing is if you play a good safe, you then you get an opportunity to try to kick at the ball, which improves your kicking skills as well. And the kicks don't count for anything, whether you scratch, miss the ball, whatever, it's just practice, and then you resume. So in theory, the best way you could play this game is if I played a lockup safe, kicked at the ball, played another lockup safe, kicked at the ball and kept going and got like a five, you know, five in a row or something like that. So, so I would have to look at a shot like this and try to see what I would want to do. And so maybe, maybe one of the shots I could play would be something like this, you know, and just try to get some of these balls intervening. So I looked at that. I didn't quite get behind the nine or get behind the five, but I didn't leave an open shot. I'm going to move this just a little bit. So now I would be able to, uh, I'd have to play it again. So this would be, I could try to send this right back down table. Right? So, so I would get a point for that. I, I prevented them from hitting the ball. And so now I get a chance to kind of work on my kicking. And I actually did that pretty well. I'd have to actually kind of curve this ball. And so it really doesn't matter if I, it's nice if you kick it, kick it well, but again, if I do something like that, and I'm just going to have to kick it again. So normally I would try to practice and pay attention to the angles and everything, but okay. So now I have a shot where I can play safe. So again, now I've got one nothing, and now I get a chance to play another safe. So, and you can see there's a bunch of different safes you can play here, but a nice simple one would be that side to side safe. And just using that five and six as a blocker. So I come over here, person can't hit the ball. So again, now I can practice 
practice kicking. Okay, so again, even though I would normally make this ball, the, the idea is to play safe, right? So I can use that 50-50 safe we talked about. I think I underhit it. Maybe I got lucky. Yep, I underhit it. <laughs> Stuart's looking right down the line. He's like, yep. Um, so anyways, you get the idea. Um, you know, something like this would be, would be a little difficult. And, you know, you're trying to move the balls around a lot. But again, if I can get that ball in a position where I don't leave a shot, then I get to try something else. Um, this is a good example too. I cross over this ball and so normally I'm trying to uh, trying to hit this rail and have the one ball go back over there. So anyways, you can kind of see if you play that game, um, you know, it's a good way to it's a good way to practice. So this would be another good shot right here. You know, I've used a little too much spin, but that's where you're going to get that feel for what to do. And if you do this for 10 or 15 minutes, um, you'll be amazed, like after just a couple weeks of doing it, you'll have a really, really good feel for it. You'll see a lot of shots. You'll get practice on your kick shots as well. And it, it's a really good way to kind of practice the safeties. So um, any quick questions before we at least stop filming? I'm going to be around here for about an hour hour or two afterwards if you guys have any individual questions or want me to look at your fundamentals or anything like that but any quick questions on yes yeah so yeah, so the question was like keeping the soldiers on the table when you're playing eight ball as far as not, it seems counterintuitive to not want to make balls, right? There's some term I think Phil Capel coined, I'm trying to remember what he called it, but it's, he called eight ball kind of a reverse scoring game. So in other words, the person that's ahead in the mat, in the game is actually the person with the most balls left on the table. So you want to leave the balls on the table until you're confident that you can run out. Now that's mostly at the upper levels. Obviously, if you're a beginner or intermediate, you want to kind of get balls off the table because your opponent is not going to be able to get up and run out. But once you start facing people that can come up and have an open shot and run out, you don't want to get rid of balls. Uh, I see people all the time, they have a ball sitting here and, and they shoot it in and then they make three more balls and they have no shot. And now they're having to try to do something fancy they miss and their opponent just runs out. Well, if they left that ball here, now when your opponent misses, there's a much better chance that you have a shot to shoot at versus I'll see them with balls here and balls here, like in the middle of the rail. If I would have left that ball there, it's really hard for them to hide me. You know, I have a kick shot, a bank shot, something. But if I have balls here and here, I, I can just put the cue ball right there or right here and leave them almost no shot, you know. But if I have a ball sitting here, that person can't leave the cue ball there anymore. So by leaving more balls on the table, it reduces the options for your opponent to kind of play safe. So again, if you're a two or a three in APA, I don't recommend that you bunt balls around the table for 20 minutes until they're perfect and try to run out, but you should be playing still some defense and not try to go for some crazy shot and maybe improve your position instead. I watched at the APA, whatever they had, the tri-annuals or cities, whatever it was a couple weeks ago, a friend of mine, I was there visiting him, and the person actually had a shot just like this. She was playing, she was a two, she was playing a seven. She actually won a game because the guy made a horrible shot. I don't even know what he was thinking. And uh, she ended up winning, so it was 1-0. And I think for APA, right, they got to beat like 6-2 or something? 7-2. And so she's 1-0. And the guy has like his nine ball here. And this is going to be somewhat from memory, but I still remember it because it was... It was something like this, and she had her cue ball like right here. And I remember they were saying it was going to be tough because these balls were kind of next to each other on the rail. And normally for a good player, you know, you take care of one, you come off the side rail, land right here, and not a problem, but it was going to be a little bit of an issue for her. So this is what it looked like, and the person had one stripe left. And she chose to play this ball first. 
uh, which wasn't horrible because she thought if she hit it perfect, she might land like right here and be able to pick off that six ball and maybe maybe shoot a little bit. But again, keep in mind, she was like a two or a three. So the chance of her running out from there slim. So what she could have done, and this ball might have been sitting out a little bit, she could have just done that and made the guy kick at the nine ball and he might have hit it, he might have not, but at least the tables changed, the balls are spread a little bit or whatever. So what happened was she went to shoot this ball and hit it a little bit thin and did something like that and she went for that ball and she missed it and the cue ball came off the rail and landed like right here straight in on the nine ball for the guy. So the guy won that game and proceeded to win the match. So I mean she had him, she had him locked up she just needed to you know do that you know and then maybe another safety battle after that, or maybe just to be a little more careful. And um, so anyways, it's, you know, leaving that ball there was an advantage for her. A and I get, if it was me, yeah, I might try to shoot that and land right here. But uh, it's better to leave it there if you can. Any other quick questions? Okay, well, thanks for coming. Like I said, if, oh, did I have one real quick? Yes, Mr. Early. So the question was like top three safeties. Um, for me, I like to keep it somewhat simple. I certainly take advantage of any opportunity I have where I can really lock up a person. But I, to me, honestly, any one of those seven safeties, I've practiced enough to be pretty comfortable. Maybe not the thin hit at distance. I don't, I don't like that. With my astigmatism, it's almost like I see a couple of fuzzy things down there. Um, now again, if I'm close, I don't mind doing it. You know, if I had a shot like this, I think I can see the ball close enough to give myself a decent chance, you know, to do something like that. So I don't mind that, but I would not try that same safety from back here typically. So I find I use the end-to-end -end safe a lot. Um, definitely use kind of the side-to-side -side safe. A lot of times there's you know, like I said, there's some balls in the way. This is kind of a classic one, right? This is the one Kevin Chim always gets you on. You know, you're sitting like this and there's a ball in the middle of the table. Well, the difference at a high level between you putting the balls like this, where the eight ball's in the middle, versus leaving it open is a huge difference. So being able to really control your speed to bring that eight ball into play uh, somehow or another, right, something like that, if I can get that eight ball, I mean, I'm right down the line right now, and now the person has to kick at the ball. If I leave this cue ball here, now they could play a safe back on me and make it worse than the one I played on them. So so that's where I think the practice comes in because you have to be very precise and have a good feel for that. Um, and honestly, I think this safe comes up a lot too. You know, hitting the ball, hitting the ball uh, two rails, um, you know, back to the end rail like that. So I think it, and you're a very good player, so I, I think what you have to do is kind of have in your brain, just like when you're shooting, you kind of run down your alternatives a little bit, and the more you practice and the more you see them, the more you watch the pros, listen to the commentators and see what they're choosing, the more it just instinctually comes to you like, oh, I'm going to do this. And sometimes I pick Ron, and after I hit it, you know, especially if I'm playing with Kevin, he'll be like, well, you know, I just didn't think about it. So... And sometimes you play a more difficult safe, but hit it really good, and, and you know, it's a hero shot. So um, I just like to play, if it makes sense, I like to play an aggressive but a conservative game at the same time. So I want to be aggressive within my means, within that 70-75% range, but if I've got a really difficult shot, there's times to shoot it. Maybe you're up, you know, on the person, or maybe you're playing a much better player and you've got to be aggressive in order to kind of try to win. Um, but in general, I, I try to try to play the percentages if that makes sense. Yep. A little bit of an outside the lines question. Take the safety concept out of tournament play. Yep. Where it's considered part of the game. And bring the safety concept into bar pool. Mm-hmm.
So the question is safeties and bar pool versus like leagues or, or tournaments. I will tell you I've never been hit in the face and I still have all my limbs because I don't play safes when I go to bars. So there you go. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so just real quick, I mean, there's still a lot of bars out there where safes are not acceptable. They have all kinds of derogatory terms for it. You just, you just don't want to cause yourself problems. But thankfully, with the foothold, the APA and BCA and USAPL and UPA, all these leagues, they embrace the concept of playing pool properly, and they have safes, and there's ball in hand and fouls, and it's all monitored and very good. So, um, so okay, well, uh, thanks, everyone. Like I said, if we have more questions, we're going to stop the streaming now, but I'll be around for a couple hours if you have more questions or want to show some examples or anything. Thanks for attending. Like I said, next class will be on kicking and banking, which should be a good one. So thanks a lot.